Welcome back to the quantum optics lecture. Today we want to talk about oscillating dipoles. We want to gain a little bit of intuition of what these electron clouds in an atom are actually doing when we set them into superposition state and how this corresponds to our classical intuition. So let's get started. So let's think of the electron inside an atom first of all as a classical object. So we have a point-like electron, a charged particle, we are applying kind of an, an oscillating electric field of it, so there's an oscillating force acting onto the electron. So for example, if we have kind of linear polarization, then this oscillating electric field is going to also drive the electron kind of in this way fashion up and down, left and right, left and right, as you can see here. If we have circular polarization, then we would expect the electron to be driven kind of maybe along a circular trajectory. So how does this correspond to the quantum mechanical calculation? What can we see from quantum mechanics? How does the quantum mechanical system behave? So let's first of all look at atomic eigenstates when the system is an eigenstate of the atomic Hamiltonian and there's no light field acting onto the system. So let's characterize these atomic eigenstates here by uh, these quantum numbers NLM like you remember maybe from the hydrogen atom, the principal quantum number the orbital angular momentum quantum number and the projection onto the z-axis, the magnetic quantum number. These are the eigenstates of the atomic Hamiltonian with eigenenergies E and LM. So if I want to calculate the electron density, so I want to calculate this electron density here, the way to do this is of course just to take the norm squared of our wave function which is going to give us the electron density in space. So if we just take norm psi squared for this eigenstate that we have here, we get the electron density distribution in our system. How does this look like? Let's go back to the hydrogen atom and let's remember, for example, that in the hydrogen atom we could separate the wave function, the eigenfunctions, into radial wave functions and angular parts. These angular parts were given by the spherical harmonic functions, the y lm functions, which depend on the spherical coordinates theta and phi. And in order, for example, to get the angular distribution of our electron cloud, we just have to calculate norm y lm squared. So this is going to give us the angular dependence of our wave function. So let's have a look for a few simple cases in ignoring the radial wave function part for a second. So we can have several situations. For example, we can be in an L equals zero state. So L equals zero, remember, that's in spectroscopic notation. That's a so-called S state in the system. And you see that the electron cloud distribution is just going to be spherically symmetric, as you can see here. So now if we're in an L equal one state, we have a P state. We have three different ML possible states that we can have, 0 or plus minus 1. And you see the ML0 state corresponds to the kind of PZ orbital that you might know from chemistry with these two lobes above and below 0. And the ML plus and minus 1 electron cloud density distribution looks like a donut. And for L equal 2 and L equal 3, this gets even more beautiful uh, with this being kind of the D state for L equal 2. And for L equal 3, these are the F states in spectroscopic notation, denoting the different angular momentum, orbital angular momentum states. Now one thing you can see already from these plots, there's nothing dynamical in them. So the electron cloud distribution is absolutely static. So we have no time evolution for these kind of atomic eigenstates. So does this also correspond to what we get from the calculation? If we calculate the dipole moment for being in such an eigenstate, do we also see this to vanish? And will this also vanish? So let's just do the calculation. So let's just pick an atomic eigenenergy state psi and lm, just for brevity, and let's label this, call this state 1. The time evolution of this state 1 is simple. We know that without the light field. That's just e to the minus i omega 1 t times the state 1, right? So now if we calculate the expectation value of the dipole operator, these exponential terms are going to cancel because here for this state 1 of t I get e to the minus i omega 1 t, but for the bra vector 1 of t I get e to the i omega 1 t plus i omega 1 t, so they're just going to cancel. So all the time dependence is going to be gone. We're just left with the expectation value of the dipole operator over this state 1. 
Now the dipole operator, remember, D, that was just minus E times the position operator of the electron, where E is the electron charge. So basically it comes down to evaluating the expectation value of the position operator of the electron of this state 1. So what can we say about that? Well, let's just make a trick. And this trick is actually useful very, very often, is that you insert the identity operator. So here I'm inserting the identity operator in form of the parity operator and its inverse. So P denotes the parity operator, so the reflection of uh, the system at the origin. So I take a system with coordinate r and I reflect it at the origin and I look what the wave function is doing to it or what my operator is doing. And the inverse of the parity operator, that's of course um, p itself. But p times p to the minus 1, that's of course just the identity, as is p times p to the minus 1. Uh, this is just the identity. So we've really done nothing. So now the trick comes in regrouping this equation. So now let's regroup this in the following way. Let's collect p to the minus 1 rp. That's just how the r vector, the r operator, transforms under parity operation. And that's just minus r. Because again, remember, a, you take the parity operator, what the parity operator does, it takes a operator r and transforms it into minus r. And then this p to the minus 1, which is essentially the same as p, acting on 1, tells us what the parity of state 1 is. And since the atomic states are parity eigenstates, this is going to be a state with a definite parity uh, of this state 1. And p acting on this bra vector is going to give us the same parity. So since the parity can only be plus or minus 1 if it's in a parity eigenstate, we get either minus 1, minus 1 here, or plus 1, plus 1, multiplied with each other always gives us plus 1. So the only thing that remains is the minus 1 from the R transformation of the R operator that we have here, of the position operator of the electron. So what we actually find is that the expectation value of the position operator when you're in an atomic eigenstate which has a definite parity, then that's going to be the same as minus the same expectation value. Now how can that be? How can something, a value here, be the same as its negative? Well, that can only be the case if the expectation value of 1 over the position operator of our electron is 0. Now that's the only way we can fulfill this equation with no other choice than having this matrix element vanish between atomic eigenstates. So we see there's no oscillating dipole moment, also quantum mechanically, when we're in an atomic eigenstate. And this, of course, makes total sense because if you think of your electron cloud distribution that we were looking at before, this is just completely static, centered on the nucleus. There's no dipole moment whatsoever oscillating in that atom.